Hello, fanbase. Today we're doing something a little different from what we typically do for these interviews. In the past, we've interviewed fans like Nathan Eltonburn, Rets of Nora, and XJ Zero, but this time we're not interviewing a fan of the show. Today, we're lucky enough to interview somebody who actually helped make the show. I'm talking about none other than John Fountain. He's served as a director, storyboard artist, and a writer for iconic episodes such as A Robot for All Seasons, Robot Riot, and No Harmony with Melody. Outside of my life as a teenage robot, he's been a part of the production of Invader Zim, The Fairly Odd Parents, and much more. We'll be focusing on his work on My Life's a Teenage Robot. As always, this interview was originally conducted over text, so Mr. Fountain had time to think over his responses to give the most meaningful answer possible. Unfortunately, Mr. Fountain couldn't record his responses for this video, so our new narrator, DC, will be his voice. Without any further ado, let's get started. Thank you for having me here. The accommodations are top-notch, and the edible arrangement was delicious. It's an honor to have you here. Firstly, I'd like to learn when you became interested in animation, and how you got your start in the industry. Cartoons were always magical to me. For as long as I can remember, they were a portal into a positively enchanting reality where fun and laughter were in the main priorities of any given moment. And when I started school and got my first glimpse at the uh, nightmare field horror show called Childhood in the 70s, I was all the more dependent on them as a means of coping. That all said, by the time I was old enough to understand how they were made, i.e. drawing things over and over again by the thousands, I had no interest in them as a career. I wanted to tell stories with my own drawings, not slave over someone else's vision. So what was the turning point that convinced you to enter the industry and work on the creations of other cartoonists? The invention of the Nintendo 64. I had taken a job at a small production company that made local commercials in my hometown, and receiving a regular paycheck was intoxicating. I had been doing newspaper comics and self-publishing independent comics, but that was very bohemian and didn't pay anything. But when I started doing small animated commercials and games, it afforded me the luxuries like a Nintendo 64. So I worked at commercials during the day and created my own stuff at night. When the shop I worked for closed up, I was forced to pack up my belongings and move to LA where, thanks to The Simpsons and Nickelodeon, Cartoons were booming and they were hiring anyone who could hold a pencil. Which was lucky for me at this point because I still knew almost nothing about the actual process of animation. But I knew enough to think I'd be a good character designer. So what was the first cartoon that you worked on? Was it as a character designer? I'm never quite sure how to tell this story because on one hand it's long, on the other hand it's wildly inspirational and fascinating on a lot of levels. But I'll spare you the details for now. During a huge LA-based animation convention, I met with the folks at Klatsky Supo, who were doing their first post-Rugrat show for Nickelodeon. I told them I was a character designer, and they said, we don't need character designers, can you do storyboards? Now, at the time, I barely knew what storyboarding even meant. But I was a long way from home, with no money, so I said, I sure do, oh boy, storyboard artist, yep, that's me utterly lied through my teeth, so I took a Rugrat storyboard test, which they liked, and got hired to do storyboards for The Wild Thornberries, my first real show. Suffice it to say, I latched onto the folks situated in their desk near mine and immediately started soaking up everything they did and learned on the job, discovering almost instantly that storyboarding is really, 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 really hard. Wishing to God I could be one of those lucky assholes doing character designs. Anyway, Thornberries was like storyboard boot camp in so much as I had to learn to be awesome really quickly. Because that show was a friggin' nightmare to board for. Every episode was a zebra stampede or a rhino chase. Meanwhile, I'd be watching stuff like Rocco's Modern Life with its quaint little stories and characters doing funny stuff and dreaming of Nickelodeon. But from the moment I set foot in LA, my goals were twofold. One, find employment, which is done. Two, pitch my own cartoons. So I instantly started pitching stuff to Nickelodeon. And after about a year on Thornberries, I kept hearing that Nickelodeon had a policy to never hire people from Klatsky Supo. 
because it was considered poaching. So around that time, I took a job doing animation for South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut, as an excuse to get away from thornberries, as well as learn a few things about digital animation. But while I was on that movie, I had pitched a show for Oh Yeah Cartoons to Fred Seibert. And while he didn't pick up my show, he liked me and my sense of humor, so he hooked me up with Larry Huber, who had just created Chalk Zone. So I started doing freelance storyboards for the whole Fred bullpen of cartoonists, including Butch Hartman, Steph McFarlane, Vincent Waller, Alex Kerwin, and yes, Rob Renzetti. So I was working 12-hour days at South Park, dealing with the constant last-minute script changes to that movie, which I think is an amazing film, and then coming home and doing freelance for Nickelodeon, which taught me to be fast, and how not to get a lot of sleep. I had learned by then that good storyboard artists, that is, people who can draw and tell story visually, were in high demand and always working. So by that time, I was stuck. I'd keep applying to shows to do character designs, and they'd always say, Oh, you do storyboards? When can you start? Yeah, so during South Park, I got an offer to go do storyboards full-time on Chalk Zone. And while I was doing that show, I also did boards for various Oh Yeah shorts, like Butch Hartman's Dan Danger and a couple others you've never heard of. And around that time, Zim was gearing up. As it so happened, I was a fan of Joan Vasquez's comic work, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. And a former colleague at Thornberry's, Steve Russell, was hired on as producer on Zim. So, tons of my pals from Klatsky Supo were getting hired for it as storyboard artists, which Steve wanted me to do as well. But I had gotten acquainted with Joan and told him I wanted to do characters, and he basically picked me out of a handful of others, which I actually kind of regret. Doing storyboards for Zim would have made me a better artist because it was such a grueling, ambitious, and cinematic show. But I was ready for a break from the monstrously harrowing world of storyboards. So I finally realized my dream of being a character designer. Fred Seibert liked the pitch I created called The Tantrum, about a little kid superhero who became powerful when he got pissed. So I was directing that short while doing characters for Zim. I referred to my time on Zim as my working vacation because it was so much fun and so comparatively easy to doing storyboards. So around that time, Butch Hartman offered me a position to direct on Fairly Odd Parents, And even though I had never directed, he promised to show me how. So I took it. Meanwhile, this whole time, Nickelodeon had chosen my Oh Yeah short as one they wanted to develop into a potential series. So I was working on that simultaneously. After a couple years on Fairly Odd Parents, I went from being a director to supervising director. After doing that for a while, Danny Phantom got a pickup, so I said to Butch that I'd like to be in charge of either Danny Phantom or Fairly Odd Parents. He considered it, but couldn't let go of either one. So I left Nickelodeon to go to Disney, where I was put in charge of developing Jake Long American Dragon. That was a mixed experience. So, when that was done, I aspired to return to Nickelodeon and Fred Seibert, who had been pushing hard for my show to get picked up, mentioned to Rob that I wanted to come back, so Rob asked me to come onto my life as a teenage robot. Now, I had been friends this whole time with Rob, Alex, Annie, Bob, Boyle, etc, etc. But this was my first time working directly for Rob. And it just instantly clicked. I had been dealing with non-stop egos, power plays, and politics for years. And when I started on My Life as a Teenage Robot, that was just over. Everyone just wanted to have fun and make a great show. Which is exactly what we did. Rob and Alex were just really easygoing, wildly talented, knew what they wanted, but eager to embrace the ideas of the people they worked with. I would practically rewrite every premise I was given, creating monstrously complex action scenes and eliminating crowd scenes because that's how I liked it. And each time, I was afraid Rob would be pissed at how much I changed stuff. I'd say, um, Rob, I changed things. Like, a lot. And he'd say, as long as you made it better, I don't care. He and Alex just created a very fun, warm, collaborative atmosphere with the staff. And it showed in the end product, which is why it still has a fan base today. Would you be able to give examples of episodes that you changed? What exactly did you change in each case? Famously, the best example is Robot Riot. The outline, we were never given full scripts, called for a huge swarm of robots to come down from the sky at the end. 
drawing crowds is always laborish, boring, and never as good on the screen as it looks on paper. It's one of the things that's starting to bother me about movies these days. Every movie ends up with 400 good guys running up against 400 bad guys. Crowds don't interest me. Characters do. So I changed it into one giant robot for Jenny to fight. Is there anything that you'd change about the show if you could go back in time before it was too late? Stylistically and artistically, I'd never ask for it to change. It was perfection. But it would have been amazing if the technology had been in sync with us. We were doing everything with pencil and paper. Had we been able to do digital storyboards? Oh my god. How'd you find your way back to the My Life's Teenage Robot community after all this time? Someone pointed out to me the infamous NSFW video of Jenny. <laughs> Those were my drawings. Edited to create... that. How do you feel about them using your work like that? The video's become so infamous to a point where it's just as well known as the show itself. I'm indifferent towards it. Stuff like that happens all the time. Getting upset would just give it a disproportionate amount of relevance. Fact is, I have a sense of humor that many would consider vile. So, who am I to judge? And hey, the discussion led me to you guys, so, silver lining. Now that you're in the community, what are your thoughts on it as a whole? What's not to love? I always thought My Life as a Teenage Robot was one of those shows that just didn't get the attention it deserved at the time. So the fact that so many people are devoted to it makes me feel as though it was worthwhile to reach the small but delightful audience that we did. I'll take quality over quantity any day. What are your thoughts on fan creations such as original characters or fanfiction? Okay, so here's the thing with me and fanfiction. I think it's great. It's the ultimate homage. That said, I just hope everyone who creates fanfiction also creates their own original stuff. I'm generally much more interested in OC stuff. To you, what separates a good OC from a bad one? Originality. Something that makes them unique to their style. You've recently started a YouTube channel. Would you be able to tell us what you plan to do with it? Well, a couple years ago, I challenged myself to create one single panel comic strip per week for an entire year. I went past the year, but eh, who's counting? I just wanted to do something to showcase my supremely corny sense of humor and draw funny things. In recent history, a lot of the animation work I've been doing has been done in Flash and or Toon Boom, wherein making actual animation is extremely easy. So I decided to basically do a quasi-animated version of the same strip. But all of this rides on the coattails of the music video I'm directing for a Grammy-winning artist that should be out sometime next year. That's about all I can say about it. But I'm really proud of it, and I think it's going to be huge. And eventually, I would love to monetize enough to create longer format cartoons without all the red tape of dealing with other entities like networks, writers, editors, etc. Fans of My Life's Teenage Robot are in a friendly shipping war. Some people want Jenny to end up with Brad, and some want her to be with Sheldon. Do you have a preferred partner for Jenny, and why? I went on a very long rant about this in the Discord, so I'll try to sum it up briefly here. If Rob said to me, write the definitive Jenny Brad Sheldon story, here's what I'd do. Jenny would first go through a Brad phase, where she dated Brad. Later, she would go through a Sheldon phase, where she dated Sheldon. In my story, Sheldon would eventually break it off because he would realize that much of his attraction was based on what she was, i.e. a technological wonder, and not who she was. In the end, they would all just be friends, because the fact is very few people meet their soulmates in high school, and I want our characters to have more life experience than that. If you had any advice to give somebody who's trying to get involved with the cartoon industry, what would it be? Ah, the inevitable question. First thing is, realize that it's an industry. Animation studios are not giant gingerbread houses filled with happy elves. Animation is, for good or ill, a branch of the entertainment industry. And just like you wouldn't show up on the Paramount Studio lot and expect them to give you a starring role in the next Star Trek movie, you can't just sort of send in a few fan art drawings to Nickelodeon and expect to get a cartoon or get on a show. Animation is an extremely technical, challenging, and competitive industry. So, realistically, as with any media industry, what you need to rack up before anything else is experience. If you have the means and you're of college age, obviously schools like CalArts or Sheridan are great stepping stones. I didn't have that, so I had to work extra hard. 
I broke in by first spending years working in small local production studios, doing local commercials. Fortunately, we live in a time when you can create animated content and put it up online. That's a huge help. It's always hard to answer this question. Because at conventions, I would get approached by these 52-year-old dudes who live with their mom and have never had a drawing lesson before in their lives, and had a few really bad Feltmarker illustrations of their favorite Pokemon ask me, so how do I get a job drawing at Disney? And me, being the cranky old bastard that I am, would be thinking, you don't. By the way, if you are a 52-year-old dude living with your mom, and you like to do fan art and stuff, more power to you. Art is meant to be enjoyed. But understand, if you're older, and experienced, and have zero background, training, or education, you are going to be competing against kids who are younger, faster, better, and have known that they've wanted to be animators since the day they were born. So you'll have a lot of catching up to do. Now, if you're around junior high, high school age, it's time to get to work. My advice to them is totally different. And that is, start practicing and do not stop. Draw every second of every day. Study film. Study the history and methods of animation. Learn every conceivable facted. Learn how cartoons are made and figure out how you would best fit in the pipeline. Character designer, director, storyboard artist, props, backgrounds, colors, sound, mix, music. And once you've figured all of that out, figure out what you can bring to the table that no one else wanting your potential job can. In my own case, because I didn't know I wanted to be an animator, I wound up studying things like writing, journalism, improv, and a whole bunch of other stuff that had nothing to do with cartooning. Consequently, I was a better writer than most animators. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Fountain. Your answers have been very insightful. Check out Mr. Fountain's YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. If you guys would like to see more interviews like this one, just let me know in the comments below. I've been Jack Hubert. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a rating. If you want to reach us, leave a comment. Or check out our other platforms. Links are in the description.